I will be sticking to my time. And actually, <laughs> to begin with, uh, chronic diarrhea is actually defined as a loose or watery stool which occur three or more times within 24 hours and lasts for four or more weeks. Because it is a very common problem. 5% of population suffers from it. And most of the episodes in developed countries are acute and self-limited and usually due to infection. But ours are a little different. But in immunocompetent patient, acute infectious diarrhea typically resolves within four weeks. And in immunocompetent in developed countries, chronic diarrhea is generally not infectious. So this is actually a, a very beautiful review which I found regarding perspective in clinical and gastroenterology and hepatology. It is, it is by American College of Gastroenterology. And it clearly defines the differential diagnosis of chronic diarrhea, which is a long list because we all know it can be watery, it can be fatty, and it can be inflammatory also. So how can symptom clusters and setting focus the differential diagnosis? I, I like to make this talk a little more practical rather than talking all what is given. So the main distinction in patients with chronic diarrhea is between functional and organic etiologies. And the functional categories include IBS when abdominal pain accompanies the diarrhea and functional diarrhea when abdominal pain is absent. So IBS can be prospectively characterized by symptoms such as those designed by, uh, defined by the Rome 4 criteria. And Again, there are certain symptoms which can prompt us regarding the diagnosis because it is very important to take a history from a chronic diarrhea patient. Abdominal pain, fever or GI bleeding can suggest an inflammatory cause. Gas and blotting can suggest a carbohydrate malabsorption. And even our patients on metformin and acarbose complain the same thing. So we should look for that. Substantial weight loss can suggest malabsorption, maldigestion on malignancy. Fatigue and night sweat should prompt you to look for lymphoma. Anemia or change in stool caliber suggests colorectal malignancy. A recent history of travel, uh, traveling should prompt you for protozoal, strongyloids, and tropical sprue and traveler's diarrhea. And a history of constipation should prompt you to look for an overflow diarrhea. And patients with diabetes are those who are attempting to lose weight. This is very common these days. You should look for their diet foods. Are they consuming anything which is causing diarrhea to them? Now the red flags are there in terms of symptomatology. We, we should be very wary of these things. These are painless diarrhea, a recent onset of diarrhea in an old patient, nocturnal diarrhea, especially if it wakes up the patient and he goes to the loo, weight loss, blood in the stool, a large stool volume, more 100, 400 grams if, if, if we can quantify by any means, I don't know how, anemia, hypoalbuminemia, and increased ESR. These are the all red flag signs which should warrant investigation in our patient. We should not wait. Then how can clinician distinguish IBS from other causes of chronic diarrhea? This is very interesting. The Rome criteria provides the framework actually for diagnosis of IBS and emphasizes pain and other etiologies also should be sought when these criteria are not met. And patient without alarm feature, as I have told you the alarm feature, who meet criteria for IBS should be treated without further testing. And one meta-analysis suggested that prevalence of CD in patients meeting criteria for IBS was more than four-folds that of the control without IBS. Now, these are the diagnostic criteria for irritable bowel syndrome. As I have told you, Manning and Rome 3 criteria. And Rome 3 has symptoms of recurrent abdominal pain or discomfort. Pain is relieved by bowel movement. And onset of pain is related to change in frequency of stool and change in appearance of stool. So now, moving forward, what is the role of diet? Because I have told, told you about the diet to be looked upon and how it can cause the chronic diarrhea. Because there are specific dietary components that may cause or aggravate chronic diarrhea. A careful dietary history is definitely a must for any patient with chronic diarrhea. And true food allergies are rare causes of chronic diarrhea. Needed. We are always prompted with food allergies, but they are uh, usually the rare cause of chronic diarrhea. Needed. Now, in considering association with food, we should consider substances that in sufficient quantity cause diarrhea in normal gut, that is fructose, and that can cause diarrhea because of an underlying condition. A condition is there and we are eating it and that is causing diarrhea, such as dairy product in lactase deficiency, or the gut alteration that limit digestion or absorption, such, such as short bowel, pancreatic insufficient, other things, and idiosyncratic food intolerances, which, which is very common these days. People are not tolerating certain, certain things like wheat, many people are not tolerating, so it can be a cause. And the identification of a dietary cause is only facilitated by a food diary. You need to ask patient to maintain a food diary and he should record what he has eaten and the frequency of stools and that will solve most of the purpose if it is food related. Now, 
lactose is a very common cause of diarrhea and it is a very common cause of diet induced diarrhea worldwide most adults are lactose intolerant and they are gradually becoming vegan and avoiding dairy foods and the fructose which is found in certain fruits actually it is naturally not in a, uh, a level which can cause uh, diarrhea but fructose is present in corn syrup which is very commonly used as a I would use the word adulterant because I don't like this molecule. So it is very commonly used to mix with anything and that is a leading cause of a strikingly increased fructose intake which causes diarrhea. Sugar alcohol malabsorption, sorbitol, mannitol, xylitol are poorly absorbed and they also cause diarrhea in many patients. Now gluten intolerance, it should be mentioned here because it is a very common cause. And the diagnosis of Crohn's disease is based on symptoms, serology, and intestinal histology as well. Now, it can present with a wider range of symptoms than it was previously appreciated. There are gluten-responsive symptoms, which we all know, which are present even in absent serology. Serology is negative, but gluten symptoms are there. And patients with chronic diarrhea should be screened for Crohn's disease, if possible. Then, Fatty and uh, fried food subsequently are implicated in pathogenesis of diarrhea and other symptoms. Food allergy are immune reaction, which can cause diarrhea, as I've told you. And 1 to 2 percent, this is rare, but 1 to 2 percent, 100 in 1 or 2, have, uh, 1 in 102, sorry, can have food allergy. So we should look for it. And frequency is higher in children. Now, what medications are common cause of diarrhea? Because there are more than 700 drugs which have been implicated as causing diarrhea, accounting for approximately 7% of the adverse effect. And this is a list which I have cut short, and these are the most commonly used drugs uh, which can cause osmotic, secretory, motility, malabsorption, and even the pseudomembranous enterocolitis also. So these are the molecules which are there and implicated for diarrhea, and we all know about this. And what are the other therapies which can cause diarrhea apart from medication? When we look to it, there is a radiation enteritis because radiation, we all know, causes up to 20% uh, of the extent of 20%. Those patients who are treated with pelvic heat radiation, they suffer from diarrhea. And the risk factors are low body mass index, prior abdominal surgery, if there is any comorbidity, radiation dose if it is too high, fractionation and technique as well as the concomitant chemotherapy. So it, this is to be looked upon when we are looking for a chronic diarrhea patient. Now post-surgical diarrhea is also very common, which is common after vagotomy, bacterial overgrowth, bile acid malabsorption, and short bowel syndrome. This is all we know and actually this is a common culprit post-surgery for a chronic diarrhea. Now when a diagnostic testing is indicated, let us see. Testing should be done in the presence of alarming features, as I have told you. If there is an alarming feature, the list which I have given you, when differential diagnosis can be effectively distinguished on the basis of test result, and when the differential diagnosis remains broad and initial testing will limit the number of additional tests needed, we should go for testing. And for disorder without definitive diagnostic test, we should go for therapeutic trials. This is a recommendation. Now, is there any benefit from, from categorizing chronic diarrhea, like we used to categorize chronic diarrhea into various, various modalities? What is the uh, actual benefit? When differential diagnosis is broad, so stool testing is a measure which can characterize diarrhea and can direct further evaluation, which would be more precise. And the chemistry test of stool can be used to categorize diarrhea, and it should be considered when the diagnosis remains obscure after the initial assessment you do. So fecal leptopherin, calproctadine, and it can be used as a surrogate measure. And stool chymotrypsin and elastase have some utility. So characterizing diarrhea type in given patient should allow a more focused differential diagnosis. And your, your, uh, your vision will become much narrower and you will be able to diagnose it much better. So there are various subtypes of diarrhea you all know. We, we all know that uh, there are three major types of diarrhea, fatty, watery, and inflammatory. And we begin with history taking, as I told you. We categorize based on the stool appearance. And if the, it is fatty, then we exclude anatomic defect. We do radiography, sigmoidoscopy, colonoscopy, and exclude the pancreatic insufficiency. We do the stool chymotrypsin level. If it is positive, confirm with secretin test. A positive result confirms pancreatic insufficiency. And if it is negative, we should explore for other diagnosis. For inflammatory, we do the stool analysis. Positive for blood or white cell, if it is there, we do the fecal calproctadine level. If it is positive, we confirm the inflammatory bowel disease. If it is not, we go on exploring the other causes. And if it is watery, we see for the fecal osmotic grab, which is, if it is high, we consider it as osmotic. 
then in if th we ask patient to fast if fasting improves it we discuss the diet history diet history again becomes very important here if diet related perform breath hydrogen test if it is positive confirm lactose intolerant and if it is uh, the fasting is not improving it we should explore other diagnosis now when the osmotic gap is normal diet modification is what is needed if it improves uh, fine we need not do anything if it does not improve we should do a celiac panel if it is positive it is celiac disease if it is negative we should again explore other causes and if the osmotic gap is low it is secretory diarrhea we should do a stool analysis we should exclude anatomic defect we should do selective tests which are required so now what is the utility of blood test because blood test they provide the clue to etiology again they uh, give us the status of the fluid and electrolytes and that other blood test should be obtained when demanded by the clinical presentation we should not write every test whatever is available we should be very judicious based on a elaborate history to uh, prescribe only those tests which are actually required and hormone secreting tumors i will tell you are very rare causes of recreatory diarrhea so we should be very wary while writing all those tests first we should exclude other causes and then move on to that so because of rarity of peptide secreting tumors measurement of circulating peptide level should be reserved for very selected patient this is what the guidelines say and in patients with classic tumor syndrome evidence of tumor or severe chronic diarrhea that remains undiagnosed after a detailed evaluation measurement of serum chromogranin gastrin vasoactive intestinal peptide or calcitonin level and urinary 5 hiaa can be considered so this is should be reserved after excluding the other causes so what is the utility of imaging actually the imaging studies are useful in patients where steatorrhea and secretory or inflammatory diarrhea is there so they define the anatomic abnormalities they delineate the degree and extent of inflammation this is what they tell they can diagnose chronic pancreatitis and they demonstrate hormone secreting tumors also so in patients with steatorrhea abdominal ct or mr scanning is done to assess for chronic pancreatitis plain radiogram you can do for evalu evaluating the colon transit and the possibility of overflow diarrhea and hormone secreting tumor can be assessed by ct scan preferably the multiphase helical ct scan pet scanning can be used in some patient again very selectively so what is the role of endoscopy enteroscopy colonoscopy and mucosal biopsy now lower gastrointestinal endoscopy uh, colonoscopy with biopsy is valuable for microscopic colitis ibd neoplasia and other inflammatory condition while upper gi endoscopy there is relatively little information regarding role of upper gi endoscopy in chronic diarrhea but esophago gastro duodenoscopy and duodenal biopsy can confirm a diagnosis of cd so upper gi endoscopy again provides a additional diagnostic methodology beyond visualization and biopsy including duodenal aspiration for giardia in this is only which i was able to found now what is the role of physiological and mi microbiological testing so bread test can assist with diagnosis of carbohydrate malabsorption in sibo and idiopathic uh, bile acid malabsorption may be more frequent than previously appreciated but there are no specific tests so empiric therapy is the only option which is available if we are suspecting that and direct pancreatic functioning again is not widely available so we test it indirectly and they, then again we go by radiographic measurement to test and look for the pancreatic abnormality what is the approach when the initial effort fail to make a diagnosis in spite of doing all these things you have done all these things and you are failing to make a diagnosis now what should be your approach the failure to make a diagnosis is more likely to uh, due to a overlooking a common cause mind it if you are failing to make a diagnosis in spite of doing all this you are not dealing with something which is uh, which is very gruesome but maybe miss you have missed something very simple this is this is actually the thing and physician should repeat the history again right from zero physical examination and review the studies already done before ordering any additional test and repeat testing should only be done with the cause if if they are very sure about it they should go for a repeat testing now what empirical treatment can be used for symptomatic management now empiric management is needed when testing does not find a specific diagnosis we are not able to find a diagnosis even after doing everything and when a specific diagnosis has no specific treatment or a treatment has failed so we use the empirical therapy opioids are the first choice they are effective and safe we all use loperamide and it is a mu receptor agonist we all know it is it slows the intestinal transit time and increases the net absorption 
And with, like all opioids, actually, it slows it. So all the opioids share the same. But why we use it? Because it has minimal penetration into the brain. That's why it has a little potential for abuse. So in chronic diarrhea, scheduled dosing is what is most important. We schedule the dose of patient. For example, if diarrhea occurs after meal, before meal dosing is used, and morning predominant diarrhea, if it is there, the dose should be given at bedtime. This should be kept in mind. This, this will improve the outcome. And there are various opioids also which are more potent, but we don't use due to its abuse potential. And potential for abuse is a serious concern when we are using an opioid for our chronic diarrhea patient because he can use it chronically. So it can be minimized by informing patient about risk of abuse, by starting with the low dose and titrating the dose gradually upwards, and by refilling prescription only when anticipated volume should have been used. You should be very cautious with these things. Now, bile acid binding resins are effective in bile acid malabsorption. Neither antibiotics nor probiotics are useful as non-specific therapy in chronic diarrhea. But I will counter this with my next slide, because this is a US guideline which is there, and I have something to show to you. Clonidine is an alpha adrenergic agonist drug. It simulates absorption and slows the intestinal transit and may be useful in diarrhea of opiate withdrawal. When we withdraw it and diarrhea is there, we can use it. Anticholinergic medication used to treat other conditions may mitigate diarrhea, so they can also be used. We can also use octreotide for small volume watery diarrhea and fecal incontinence. Fiber supplementation or a hydrophilic poorly fermentable colloid may be helpful. And we also use soluble fibers such as pectin, which increase the viscosity of luminal content. Oral calcium supplement, if we are giving to our patient, may help in chronic diarrhea because uh, they also help along with bismuth subsalicylate, which is also frequent OTC, which helps in chronic diarrhea. Allocetron is also there. So there are a lot of things which we can use by our judiciousness. And actually, there is no simple and logical algorithm to govern the empirical therapy. Therefore, a thoughtful trial and error approach is frequently required to find the most effective therapy or combination of therapy for each patient. So if we are if you are lucky enough to make a diagnosis, we can treat it in a proper manner with the given diagnosis. But if you are not able to make a diagnosis, then empirical therapy is only the way out. And this is actually a thing uh, which, uh, thanks to Dr. J.K. Sharma, which I came across. And this is a, this is a rectally administered E. coli uh, for acute distal ulcerative colitis, and it gives us very good result. So the take home message is chronic diarrhea is much more common than we think. History remains the integral component in our management, and we should not forget the food diary. We should use the investigations judiciously, judiciously because there are n number of investigation. There is no simple logical algorithm. Trial and error is the only way for empirical therapy. And failure to make a diagnosis is more likely due to overlooking a common cause rather than searching for a rare cause. Thank you.